Hi Ritwik. Hello. Hey, oh. Ritwik, am I audible? Yes. Great, yeah, great. <coughs> so we'll just give it another minute. Mm -hmm. If anybody else is going to join for the panel, mm -hmm. then I'll otherwise, yeah. Uh, otherwise, we both can. So right now I am working with KMG IT Services Gurgaon. So right now I am uh, working in an hybrid environment in which 50% 50 50 of that includes cloud and 50% of that includes IT internal operations. So if I talk about internal operations, my task is to handle all the networks and servers and all the related stuff. And uh, if I talk about uh, the cloud, so all the resources which are required to be created for the production environment and apart from that uh, they are monitoring and uh, since it's a software development company so a devops part is also included so we use various types of uh, tools in uh, uh, devops so this is the overall profile i am working okay uh, when you said you take care of a cloud environment which cloud vendor are you taking care of specifically aws and little bit of azure okay all right so in aws what are the tasks do you take care of so uh, there are some infrastructure which are already been uh, established so my task is to uh, monitor them and uh, take care of them that whether they are working properly or not and there are some uh, uh, infra uh, which has to be created from the scratch so whole team is responsible for uh, that and uh, so this is the overall scenario. So have you ever played a role in creation or implementation of uh, uh, any infrastructure component? Hmm. In uh, cloud? Yes. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Okay. And what was it? So there were uh, various types of projects. So some were, uh, some were uh, the website hosting related and some were uh, the VPC and uh, server uh, creation. So these types of tasks were there. And apart from that, uh, VPC endpoint uh, creation. And uh, so, and we had a virus uh, attack. So. Uh, we had created the S3 bucket for uh, the movement of the data for our users. So for that, uh, we had used DynamoDB, Lambda, IAM and S3. So these kinds, so uh, we got the requirement from the client. And uh, apart from that, uh, we, I have to create the IC2 instances uh, sometimes and hand over it to the client engineer. So these types of tasks in AWS. Okay. So uh, when you talk about the cloud, uh, uh, is there any specific service you are most comfortable with or you feel like there is a specific service service where uh, you are not that much comfortable yeah in uh, if i talk about the devops uh, part so in uh, kubernetes etc i am not that much comfortable otherwise uh, i i have i am so there are some of the resources which i have only touched and uh, there are some of the resources which i have uh, in uh, good exposure so in that way. Okay. Okay. Uh, in Kubernetes, uh, uh, what do you know of, uh, about this product? What What does it do? Why? So do Kubernetes. Uh, so, uh, should I explain complete uh, that I have knowledge? Just give me a quick idea. I so, just want to understand. How much Kubernetes is an orchestration tool. So, the, if I talk about the Docker, so the Docker Swarm orchestration has some scaling related issues. So for that, uh, uh, we use Kubernetes for complex uh, applications, which requires a lot of scaling. So the uh, de uh, deployments are done using the uh, pods. So the pod is consist of a, a group of containers. And uh, so there are the services which are included in k 8 as a cluster IP node export, load balancer, and uh, CNAME. And, uh, 
so and we can create thousands and thousands of clusters in uh, kubernetes so <coughs> in this way the kubernetes is deployed okay let's say i'm running a pod or let's imagine a uh, apache uh, web application mm -hmm. okay and uh, i want to access that uh, particular application from outside the cluster mm -hmm. of kubernetes mm -hmm. okay uh, how would you enable this so uh, we will uh, use the uh, node port uh, service of the uh, kubernetes or ingress uh, service okay what is the difference between these two ingress and uh, so uh, node port uh, uh, is always uh, used to access the service from the outside and if uh, uh, we want uh, an ingress in is the uh, walk around kind of thing ingress is what sorry uh, walk around kind of thing Uh, basically if you do not want to use the node uh, port uh, so the so if you want to access the content from the outside so for that we will use the ingress okay let's imagine my application apache application on the pod uh, is running on uh, port 8080 okay 8080 mm -hmm. would i be able to use the same port uh, over node port now we will have to do the port mapping for uh, this let's let's say you have done the port mapping mm. now but my question would be my application is running on port 8080 in inside the pod right mm. is it feasible for me to map port 8080 from the pod to my node port port 8080 no no and why you are mapping uh, same port no, that is not applicable Okay, let me put another question then. If my application is running uh, inside the pod at uh, port 8080, mm. can I map it to port 9000 on node port? Mm, yes. Are you sure? I'm not so sure. Uh, I have told you that uh, in K and uh, Kubernetes, my task is only to. install that uh, kubernetes on uh, the ec2 instances and hand over it to the client engineers and they continue with their <coughs> production okay if you have to create multiple replicas uh, of a particular pod what are the things you would need to do so we will uh, uh, create uh, the command for the um, a number of replicas uh, So any way. any idea about uh, any idea about the command that we use? So right now I don't remember the command. Okay, mm -hmm. no issues. Uh, so when we want to access any Kubernetes cluster, uh, what are the things would you need? So imagine a situation where you are onboarded to a organization, okay, mm -hmm. and you are part of you are being inducted as a part of uh, DevOps team. Okay, mm -hmm. now. Of course, the team would have to hand over access to all the environment uh, components to you, right? Mm. So for Kubernetes, what all the things would you require in order to access it, access that cluster? So first of all, uh, if uh, it is hosted in AWS, so I will require to access. Uh, If it is in uh, Linux, so, so the all the pem keys, etc. And uh, and apart from that, uh, for accessing the Kubernetes, uh, mm, so the access will be granted by the organization only. Yeah, of course, access would be granted by organization. I'm just trying to understand. What are all the components you would need to access that Kubernetes cluster? I will take an example to relate uh, more to this question. <clears throat> When you want to access any Linux server, mm. uh, okay. Let me ask you this: If you want to access a Linux server, mm. what are the different ways you could provide uh, a user uh, uh, to authenticate to that server? So there are two ways. Uh, if we are using a Windows machine, so 
we will go to the command prompt and write a cd dot downloads command and or otherwise follow the path of the pem file and take access in command prompt otherwise uh, take the access uh, using uh, uh, putty using the pem uh, sorry ppk file and uh, if the users are created so uh, users will have the uh, <coughs> yeah, restricted uh, access to that server so you mentioned you, you might need either uh, ppk pem file which would uh, not now ppk and pem would fall in same category right mm -hmm. they fall in the keys category the other way is to use username and password right so that means password based credentials right e based credentials and password based credentials so, so if i uh, so if i talk about the those passwords so there are two options so first of all we will have to create uh, the user at using user at command so we will have to create the users and uh, for the password we can use password every time and uh, uh, if the user is trusted, so we can uh, use passwordless authentication. Okay. Uh, so, uh, now that you have understood that uh, we require either key combination or username password based combination to access any server. Uh, so, now, accessing uh, the server and uh, Kubernetes is a bit uh, different thing. Uh, that's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking. What okay. do you need to access Kubernetes? Uh, so for that uh, we will uh, either uh, log in uh, using uh, putty or uh, uh, if the users no. No. okay in, uh, no. so uh, there might be some uh, credential related feature to the kubernetes have you heard of kubeconfig kubeconfig that is the configuration file for the kubernetes but i have not uh, done anything on that file till now Because uh, okay. in our company, uh, that authentication is not required, we access that server directly. Have you ever run any Kubernetes command uh, to your Kubernetes cluster? Yes, to get the services and the number of pods and the status, uh, so those commands I have. Uh, so can you just talk, uh, talk a little about what all the commands have you run? Can you give me those commands? Uh, so we use kubectl get parts and uh, queue cutter get uh, services and uh, so these are the basic commands to check the status of uh, the if i have uh, multiple namespaces then how would i check the parts and services uh, that i am not okay. okay so now answer my question if let's say you are in the same network mm -hmm. where uh, your kubernetes cluster is okay <clears throat> And you have QCDL tool installed on your machine mm -hmm. from where you want to try to access it. Do you feel you would be directly able to access that cluster? QCuttal uh, is uh, configured, I think no. Okay. Have you worked on Docker? Yes. Okay. What are the things uh, uh, did you take care of? So, end to end uh, DevOps. Uh, Sorry, Docker uh, uh, deployment. When you say end to end, uh, what are the things does uh, it include? So, uh, pulling of the image from the doc container registry, and apart from that, uh, if you want to uh, deploy uh, using Docker file, so we can use the Docker file for the various parameters and the arguments, and apart from that, uh, <coughs> if uh, we can create images and then create containers and uh, have to make the data persistent, we can create the persistent uh, for loops uh, and uh, port mapping and run the Docker in the background or the foreground. So those kind of stuff. So do you do all of these things uh, manually? Uh, we, whole team is uh, responsible for that. So yes, uh, we do it uh, manually. So if, if I talk about the, so there are two types of things. So if there is a microservice uh, architecture uh, and that need to be composed in uh, a single unit. So for that we use a compose file, uh, uh, basically Docker compose and uh, <coughs> by automation, uh, uh, we can use the CI CD uh, in uh, using the Jenkins. But uh, if we oh. but if we are creating from the scratch, so uh, first time it has to be done manually. 
what is the difference between a docker file and a docker compose file so docker file is basically uh, so if we are creating a single uh, uh, file uh, from a single image for, so for that we use the docker file and uh, so if there is any application uh, which for which we do not want to run the run command uh, to convert image to the container continuously again and again and uh, if the application is using multiple uh, images so for that we use the docker compose file which is a yml uh, file in yml format so so you're saying if you are planning to use multiple images docker images then we will go for docker compose if you are going to use only one image then we go for a docker file that's what you're uh, saying so if the uh, 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 application is a uh, complex like it uh, is consists of front end and the back end and the databases and all those stuff so for uh, to wrap that application into a single unit uh, for that we will use the docker compose and if we want to avoid running the run uh, command again and again so for that uh, also we use the docker compose so that uh, multiple things can al uh, also be done in the docker file but uh, that uh, for every image the process has to be re repeated again and again so docker compose uh, we can compose multiple images in there so how, how do you run a docker compose file uh, docker compose up Okay, now let's okay. Let's say I want to run a container mm. in Docker, and I want to ensure that even if my host restarts, the container should automatically back up online. How would I ensure that? For that, we can we should use uh, the persistent volume. Persistent volume is to uh, persist the data uh, with which could could have been the inside the container right if you have uh, 10 files inside the container mm -hmm. and you want to ensure that even after uh, the container terminates or stops mm -hmm. the data should persist in that case you use persistent storage mm -hmm. i'm talking about uh, let's say you have a container running on a server and the server has gone down right for some xyz reason right mm -hmm. now when the server came back online the container is not running mm -hmm. right so it, it could be either in stop state, right? It could be anything, but it's not running. That's mm -hmm. all. I want to ensure any time or every time the server goes down or restarts, the container should come back automatically. So I have uh, faced this kind of issue once, but uh, but I fixed using persistent volume only. After this session, you can dig in more about this. Okay. Uh, yeah, because, uh, because when the server went down, uh, we pulled the data back uh, from the volumes and uh, the... No, 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 that's not how it is. I think you did not understand the question which I am asking. Yes, I, I did understood. Uh, the server is restarted or down, so the container should come up automatically. And uh, yes. uh, that should be uh, automated and not uh, uh, the engineer should not pull manually the data and create it all over again from the volume. Not pull, not pull, not pull. The engineer should not go back to that server mm -hmm. and start the container manually. It mm -hmm. should be automatically taken care of. Mm -hmm. okay. So, okay. Um, coming back to AWS, have you completed any certification? So, earlier I was a CCNA certified, but right now I am preparing for AWS certification. And which one are you preparing for? Associate. Solution Architect Associate? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And you are running yourself or you have joined some uh, training? Uh, so training. Okay. And when are you planning to complete it? Uh, as soon as I get uh, comfortable with uh, all of that stuff. So right now I am preparing. Uh, in next uh, two to three months I am preparing. Planning okay. to complete it. Okay. So let's talk more about AWS. Uh, let's say I have a SD bucket. Mm. Right. And uh, I have a EC2 instance. Mm. Uh, and now I want to access uh, the test bucket from the EC2 instance on a private network. I do not want my connection to go through the internet. How can I uh, implement this? Uh, uh, 
so we can use the signed url for uh, this kind of uh, thing even if you will create signed urls the calls would again go through the internet mm -hmm. we want to ensure that all the calls are going are traveling uh, within the uh, aws network so for that uh, we can create a uh, bucket policy or something because s3 is meant to store the data for the so uh, we will not grant the public uh, access to the s3 and uh, uh, we'll make it uh, private only because whenever we are creating an s3 bucket so it gives an option that whether we want to make it public or may uh, make uh, continue to use it uh, privately Uh, have you heard of VPC endpoint? Yes, VPC endpoint is used to make the private connection between the VPC and other resources uh, uh, to avoid the uh, because NAT gateway incurs a lot of uh, charges. So to avoid that uh, cost, uh, we can use the VPC endpoint and the connection between the resources is private. Uh, do you feel if you, if we create VPC endpoint, uh, then it does not incur any charges? So it will incur charges, but it is a substitute for the NAT gateway. On that instance. Wait, uh, you are saying that VPC endpoint is a substitute for NAT gateway on that instance. Hmm. And to make the private connection between uh, <coughs> the VPC and any other related service. Okay. So when I ask the question of establishing a, a, a connection between EC2 and S3, hmm. right? Uh, using the AWS own backbone network. I think you already given the answer. We see endpoint is the answer for that. Mm -hmm. um, why do we use a bucket policy? Uh, to uh, there, there are various types of uh, uh, scenarios. So if uh, if we want to uh, that uh, restrict the access to the S3 for that, we use the bucket policy. And apart from that, if we are using in conjunction with any other service, say Route 53 or any cloud front, so we have to update the bucket policy. Uh, uh, to access that, uh, basically S3 can be mapped with other services like uh, CloudFront or Cloud53. So for that, uh, we have to update the bucket policy. Otherwise, uh, it won't work. Does it provide? Uh, does your bucket policy provide network level of, uh, access or authentication based access to your bucket? I think a network level access because authentication uh, level access I have not uh, come across. So uh, basically the connectivity uh, is required. Uh, I mean to how say. Do you find, uh, how do you define the connectivity in public policy? Uh, that I don't remember. Uh, okay. But uh. you said that it provides network based access. So we uh, take the policies from the AWS documentation or the internet and make changes according to our requirement. So the exact, uh, the, because there are a lot of commands, so uh, it is the, very difficult to remember those commands. Okay. Hmm. Uh, do you know about lifecycle policy? Uh, so lifecycle policy is basically, so if you want to move any data automatically to the uh, to any uh, type of the storage to that incurs the less charges for that we use the life cycle uh, policy is there any other use of life cycle policy uh, yes uh, the data which has to be accessing uh, in an infrequent way and uh, so and to apart from that to saving the cost so for that we use the life cycle so the data is automatically moved to uh, that, uh, those kind of storages uh, which uh, incurs the which are to be accessed less frequently and, and ultimately cost le uh, less uh, charges. Anything else? Uh, anything else? Uh, yeah, there is a uh, so uh, another feature is that the data is automatically deleted. So, for example, if uh, we have to persist the data for say suppose two to three months and uh, that the, the three months past data is uh, not required. So the data is uh, the automatically deleted. So that feature is also included. Okay. Have you created any uh, manual AMI of uh, uh, running EC2 instance? Manual AMI means? Uh, okay. Let me take a step back. Have you created any AMI? Yes. AMI okay. means uh, 
there are two ways uh, either to uh, get in uh, the AWS console and uh, create uh, select the EMI Amazon image and create that server and if we want to take the image of that so go to the images and take the image of uh, that snapshot oh sorry EC2 okay. instance so okay so when you create the AMI hmm. okay, when you create AMI and offer running server hmm. uh, you are getting my question right hmm. if the server is already running you are trying to take the AMI of that server hmm. now my question is would it by default restart the server or not restarting which server the server for which you are taking the AMI no you sure the server will not restart uh, so as far as my knowledge is concerned so if that is a running server so we will create another replica and stop that server and then we will take the uh, image so restarting is not uh, the, I have not seen when yes, the server is restarting using uh, while creating the image uh, server is, will not restart or otherwise I am I am not come across that thing when you click on create AMI, when you select any easy to instance mm. and you click on create AMI, mm. okay what are the options do you see so we go to the actions and uh, create an uh, image so there are various kind of options so on left hand side uh, we have uh, uh, like DHCP option sets and elastic IP and all those stuff and then uh, above uh, wait, 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 you are talking about launching instance not creation of AMI, I am talking about why creating AMI so in the starting uh, we have not created any server uh, during that time so we see all the AMIs which are provided by the AWS Apart from that, we configure security groups and user data script and whether we want to join any domain or the number of uh, we, uh, see the uh, VPC to which data is to be joined and the public and the private. So whatever you are saying right now, it is how to launch mm -hmm. it is not. It does not talk about how to create an AMI. Okay. See, when you launch an instance and in the very first step when you select the AMI mm. that AMI is provided by AWS or the marketplace mm -hmm. okay. you want to create your own AMI out of a running instance mm. I will give you a scenario let's say you have 10 EC2 instances running okay. mm. Mm. couple of them could be running web server uh, couple of them could be running TV server now you want to take a backup of mm. those instances mm. right so what you do you create an AMI of these running servers. Create an image. Uh, okay, what is the full form of AMI? Amazon image. That's right. So that means both the things when you say creation of image or creation of an AMI, both, mm -hmm. are, both are same thing. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, okay. So that's what I'm asking. When you create image, not launching an instance, mm -hmm. create image, what are the options that you get to select? So that the uh, we have to check the AWS console and work accordingly to that because there are a lot of options so it is not possible so to remember you, them. Okay, so have you done it before? Yes, done it but uh, everything I cannot remember on the spot. So there are various kind of uh, the scenarios so we can give the uh, permissions and uh, there is an uh, encryption option and network option and uh, selection of the security groups and uh, network related no, no, option. No, no. Again, again, boss, you are again falling back to launching an instance. No, no, no. The, uh, these kind of uh, options are uh, available in actions uh, tab about the and uh, AWS has recently also changed its uh, console. So you are saying that you have created AMI before but you do not remember the option. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, because uh, in the AMI, uh, so first of all, the uh, AWS has changed its console, and uh, you are asking me the options. So uh, there are various kind of options like uh, we can. Uh, uh, okay, okay, hold on. 
I'm not talking about the options which you get when you click on actions. Mm. I'm talking about the options which you get when you try to create AMI. So those options have not changed. That uh, I need to check then. Okay. Mm. Okay. What is the difference between a private subnet and a public subnet? So the uh, subnet. Uh, 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 which is exposed to and uh, the data which can be moved uh, from internet to that subnet that is known as the <coughs> public subnet and uh, the private subnet is the subnet uh, which is not supposed to be exposed to the internet and uh, is the data is accessed to and fro by the net gateway or net instance. Okay, let's say I have a net gateway in a subnet mm. okay. and in that subnet I have 10 machines. Mm. Right. Uh, my first question would be, would I be able to perform patching on these servers? Uh, please repeat the question. I have a subnet mm. and in that subnet I have a net gateway. Mm. Okay. Now in the same subnet I have around 10 machines and if I want to perform patching on these 10 machines, mm. would I be able to do it? Uh, yes. Okay. My second question is, if uh, let's say uh, after a week or so somebody comes to me and says hey you know what i want to access one of these 10 servers mm. from the internet mm. would i be able to access uh, then that get when that instance is uh, uh, already in place net gateway is there So the access will be uh, the given uh, using the server which is exposed to the public, uh, uh, which is located in public subnet. Because uh, to access the private subnet, we have to copy the key. So we will take uh, the access from public to the private, and then the connectivity will be established. So you're saying that even if we have NAT gateway in that subnet. Um, no one would be able to access the instances in that So for that uh, uh, we have to make changes uh, in the securities and uh, given the restricted uh, or uh, basically that depends we uh, will have to give the access to. Let's say uh, I have allowed uh, uh, the access in my security group from everywhere mm. okay mm. but still I have NAT gateway in that subnet. Mm. Would I be able to access uh, the server now from the internet? Yes, we are the net gateway we can access. Okay. Why would you choose a net gateway instead of an internet gateway for somewhere? Because net gateway is supposed to connect the private and the public segment and the internet gateway is supposed to uh, as a gateway or a, an entry point for the uh, wide area network and uh, local area network. So the Basically, uh, internet gateway is supposed to, uh, yeah, one minute. Yeah. So internet uh, gateway is supposed to expose, to be expose the data to the internet and uh, net gateway is, is supposed to uh, connect uh, uh, the connectivity between uh, basically within the LAN uh, uh, to connect uh, the public and the private uh, netting or public to public or private to private. Mm, no. There is a specific reason why we use uh, NAT gateway or NAT instance in any manner. But I will defer it to you. Uh, even after this uh, discussion, you can take your time to go through the documentation and you can read about it. But there is a specific reason why a NAT gateway is used instead of an internet gateway. Mm. Okay. Uh, <coughs> what is the peering connection? Yeah, to connect the VPC to VPC uh, using a private connection, for that uh, we use the VPC peer. Okay, let's say I have two AWS accounts and would I be able to create peering connection between uh, VPCs which are there in different AWS accounts? Ah, one minute, I am getting a call from uh, my office.
yes uh, what was the question yeah my question was uh, if i have multiple aws accounts <clears throat> would i be would i be able to create peering connection between the vpcs which are residing in different aws accounts yes we will have to give the vpc id so for the redundancy purposes uh, we use that so the practical example of that is in one uh, vpc we have uh, configured uh, the web server and in another another uh, we create the database server. so that is the practical example okay all right uh, okay so uh, you said you are experiencing jenkins as well right yes okay so uh, have you created any pipeline before uh, yes Did you create a standalone pipeline or multi-branch pipeline? Standalone pipeline. Standalone pipeline. Okay. Uh, what are the things it, uh, did you need to create a pipeline? So first of all, we had to create uh, the Jenkins uh, portal in an EC2 instance, and apart from that, sub supply user ID and password. Basically, the, uh, the whole configuration has to be done and. Uh, Let's say you have everything. Jenkins portal everything is there. Uh, let's say you are onboarded to an organization, okay? Mm. And these people are already using Jenkins. Mm. The portal is there. Authentication mechanism is there. All the plugins are installed, right? It's just that one fine morning, mm. uh, the customer says that, "Hey, uh, Ritwik, you know what? I have this application. I want you to create a pipeline for this, mm. right? Now you have Jenkins. You have credential to it. Now, now what do you?" So we will install various types of plugin which are required uh, to be created uh, for the standalone pipeline and uh, where are, and uh, the script uh, and uh, if we are uh, creating uh, using the Jenkins file, so various stage, stages are to be defined. So in that way the pipeline is configured or otherwise we can integrate uh, to the Docker. Okay. Hmm. Um. Which language uh, is this Jenkins file uh, created in? Groovy. Right. So let's say I have a uh, uh, few applications uh, for which I need to run build on a different server from Jenkins. Okay. So what would I need? Oh, please pardon. Okay. Let's say I have a .NET application. Mm. Okay. And I have to run uh, a pipeline for that application, which includes multiple stages. One of those stages is to run build. Okay. Mm. Mm. Now I do not want to run the build on my uh, actual Jenkins server. I want to run it on a different server altogether. Mm. Right. How can I accomplish this? Any idea? My use master slave architecture. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I think I'm good. Uh, so. Uh, Ashish. Hello. Uh, yeah, Shashank. Uh, I think I'm also good. Uh, I've heard all the conversation. Yeah. I think uh, that. Yeah. So uh, you. Seems fine with me. Yeah. Uh, so there is In one. Case, if you have any query, yeah, that we can. Yes. Ask. Yes. Yes. So when you had asked me the NAT and the uh, basically internet gateway and the NAT gateway question, I was getting a call from my office. So I need a discussion again on that question. So NAT is basically used to uh, map uh, one IP to the another that can be public to public, uh, public to private and uh, that to public to public also. And if I talk about uh, the internet gateway, so the gateway which separates uh, the local area network or wide area network in traditional networking so that is known as uh, internet gateway and if i talk about uh, the cloud so uh, it separates vpc from the public internet and the net gateway net instance is used to separate the subnets for the classification of vpc so that mm, is still not quite there okay. there is a specific use case why we use that gateway so uh, when you Whatever you just told, you gave a basic idea of what is matting, mm. okay? And you talked about what is internet gateway. Uh, I will give you points for uh, uh, 
defining the use of internet gateway but there is uh, a use case of why we use NAT gateway in any organization and it is uh, the same use case for every organization why they use NAT gateway. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So no worries, go through it, go through the documentation again mm -hmm. whenever you get time, okay, you will get to know it. Okay. okay. Any other question you would like to ask us? Uh, no, no. All right. Thanks, Ritvik. Uh -huh. Really appreciate you giving us time and your patience. Okay. And uh, thank you so much. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Ritvik. Thank, oh, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.